have any more labs in this class? No, we'll have like a final, so like starting next Tuesday, we'll have kind of a synthesis activity the last two weeks of the class, and that will be sort of like a culminating activity of the class. We'll get you the write-up for that, like the description of it later this week, probably Thursday. Um, and what that does is it sort of blends everything that, um, it, it blends all of the, you know, kind of um, the modules that we've done in this class, except for maybe the modeling one, although arguably like the whole thing is a model. Um, so in essence, what we're gonna have you do is try and estimate how much water is recharged to the groundwater in Dry Creek Experimental Watershed. So that's gonna involve kind of estimating snow volumes and also estimating, um, uh, estimating um, analyzing some soil moisture data um, and also estimating evapotranspiration um, and analyzing the discharge data that you have in, in order to sort of make an estimate of like, well, you know, at the very beginning of the class when we did this water balance approach, um, we made some pretty gross assumptions about like year to year, there's no change in like groundwater storage. And so that allows us to kind of back out based on the discharge and the precipitation, how much evapotranspiration occurred. But what this last syn synthesis activity is gonna do is relax that assumption and say, well, maybe in fact, like the, there is kind of a year to year or a longer term variability in the groundwater storage in the watershed. And so we wanna estimate like how much could that recharge flux be? Okay, so that's kind of gonna be the overarching, um, overarching arc of that kind of last synthesis activity. Um, so you'll be kind of analyzing a lot of the same data sets that you've already been working with in the class so far, but maybe doing it through a new light or with some slightly different um, assumptions and approaches. Okay. Um, but yeah, more will be coming about that and we'll introduce that as well um, next week. So, okay. Um, so this is the kind of second of two uh, lectures on the subject of modeling that we will do. So this is modeling two. And just to reflect, last time, right, we covered why we model. Right, and, and one reason is to predict, right, we are engineers and applied scientists and we need to make predictions kind of for, you know, societal reasons, flood protection, ecosystem protection, uh, water supply, you know, those kinds of applied purposes. Another reason that we model is to understand, right, And, and these are linked together because our predictions are imperfect, right? So we make predictions. We know that those predictions are not perfect. That imperfection reflects a lack of understanding and the underlying processes that are at play and how we represent them mathematically or numerically. It represents limitations in the data. And so we also use models... Um, uh, we also use models to kind of test hypotheses, right? So, so um, uh, a, um, one of my professors, um, this is more about kind of talking about weather forecasting models, but I think it holds more broadly, right? That a prediction or a forecast is kind of an ultimate hypothesis test, right? Like you are going to determine whether or not you are correct when you issue that forecast. You don't have the data to to verify at the start, but you will after you sort of run the experiment, which is kind of waiting for the weather or the hydrologic response to unfold. And so that kind of lack of predictive skill um, does in fact, you know, kind of represent to us the, the areas or the room for improvement we have in refining our scientific understanding. So that's why we model. So we also talked about what is a model, 
right? And um, it's an abstraction of reality. Right, so it's, it's a way of representing the real world in kind of a numerical or a mathematical sense. Um, and it allows us to make quantitative predictions. Okay. And then finally, the last thing we talked about is kind of the how, how we model. Right, and we talked about two different approaches. Approach one is kind of the physics-based route. Right, where we say, well, we know that mass is conserved. We know that energy is conserved. We know that F equals MA, right? There are some fundamental things that we understand and know about the universe um, and that we can rely and start from those first principles and construct a quantitative or computational model of a system. And we can use that, right, to make predictions. And what's nice about that approach is that um, in principle, that approach is transferable to places where we, we don't necessarily have all of the data or the observations, right? So if we don't have observations of, for instance, stream flow in a watershed, we can still use that model um, because it relies on, on the physics, right? Um, so the, the upside of that is it sort of relies, there's some, there's some niceties to the fact that it relies on kind of the physics um, you know, that the physics and the thermodynamics and the material properties that you all have been learning about in your various kind of science and engineering classes. The downside of it is that um, they tend to be more complex. We lack physical, complete physical understanding. Um, there are some closure problems. We talked about that in the soil moisture module with respect to um, hysteresis and the soil water retention curve. So we have to do things like result to empirical methods to kind of fit soil hydraulic behavior um, to more simplified models, right? So even though we rely on physics, we still wind up having to invoke some kind of empirical relationships that are not quite physical. Approach two is um, a conceptual approach, right? And the conceptual approach basically says, well, you know, let's come up with some kind of conceptual and, and perhaps more mathematically simple representation of a hydrologic system. We can come up with some mathematical relationships that we know how they behave. We'll have some number of parameters and we can calibrate those parameters um, against observations, and in doing so, we, we wind up with a model that's relatively simple, easy to calibrate, um, and is perhaps very accurate because we can run the model a lot. It's computationally inexpensive. So what I wanna do today is actually, um, we are going to, at the very end of last time, right, we talked about how we could start from a water balance approach, but I wanna sort of fully develop a conceptual model kind of mathematically in today's lecture and sort of show you how we get to an actual prediction of something that we care about, something like stream flow, um, how we can relate that to some of the measurable properties that we, um, measurable quantities that we've talked about throughout the class, things like groundwater, soil moisture, precipitation, and where evapotranspiration comes into play. Right, and we'll talk about this approach of sort of calibration. How do we sort of tweak the parameters of these models? What are the parameters of these models? Um, and how do we tweak them to kind of move our model closer to reality, okay? So uh, today we will develop a simple conceptual model.
Okay. All right. So again, let's draw, right? I'm, I'm an engineer. So the first thing I was always, I don't know if they still teach you all to do this, but the very first thing I was taught to do whenever I approach a problem or whenever I do a problem set is do what? Free body diagram, right? Or draw a picture, okay? All right, so let's draw a picture of what we're actually kind of trying to model here, right? So here's our watershed, okay? And let's account for kind of the fluxes in and out of our, in and out of our system, okay? So let's add, okay, there's our tributaries. Okay, so I've already kind of drawn, what's the, what's the outflux here at the outlet of our watershed? Q, this is our discharge. Okay, where, what are the other kind of so-called forcings on our system? Where are the other arrows and what is their direction? Precipitation. Yep, precipitation. Okay, what else? ET, what else? Yeah, so okay, so let's change this a little bit. I'm gonna change colors here. So there, um, let's talk about what the state variables are, right? So what, are, you know, so these are the so-called fluxes Right, so what are the states of our watershed? Um, I'm gonna say this is W1, this is snow storage. Actually, let me modify this slightly. Because to start, I'm gonna leave snow storage out, but we wanna acknowledge that it's important in our watershed. So this is snow storage, okay. What else are kind of the states of our system? What are the stores of water in our system? Yep, yeah, so let's call that one something like W2, groundwater. And then what else? What's maybe in between the snow and the groundwater? Surface water? We could include a surface water, but I think a little bit lower. Soil moisture. Yeah, let's do soil moisture. Soil moisture. Okay. Uh, okay, now... What we're doing right here is, is great, right? So we, we're having these debates or these thoughts about what, what actually are the source, what are the stores of water that we need to include in our water? Do we need to represent the surface water storage? And that might sort of depend on kind of where you are, where your model is, is conceptually, right? So if we're doing this in the desert kind of, you know, in the cold desert here, maybe there's not a lot of surface water storage, right? Like maybe it's just some streams and some creeks, but the overall storage component there is like minuscule, okay? Whereas if we're doing this in like Minnesota, right? The land of 10,000 lakes, perhaps surface water storage is actually a really important component of the storage. So all of those are good responses I'm gonna keep this kind of simple um, for the purposes of developing this model. And then we'll come back and sort of critique our model and decide where we could sort of make some improvements. So there's one kind of property about this watershed that I want to name, but we're not necessarily going to sort of discuss it right now or, or where it comes. You'll, you'll hopefully see in terms of uh, where, where this will become important, but this watershed has an area associated with it, right? So this is a watershed area, okay? Uh, 
Okay, so what I would like to do is I want to, I want to represent, um, I want to represent our watershed I want to represent, uh, let's, let's represent our watershed as two connected leaky buckets. Okay. All right, so what this is going to look like, right, is that, um, well, it's exactly, it's exactly this, right? So, we have one bucket here, we have another bucket here. Actually, let's make our upper bucket smaller. Okay, and what do I want to do? I want to say, okay, well, conceptually, this is my soil moisture storage. This is my groundwater storage. Okay, and so each of these buckets represents kind of one of these two different, two different stores that we have right here that we just named, okay? Again, we're gonna kind of, snow would be a different bucket and I wanna sort of add it back later, okay? So for now, we're just going to pretend like this is, you know, in a not snowy place where surface water is, surface water storage is kind of less important, okay? And I want to say, okay, well, let's, let's kind of translate these forcings, right? These fluxes of water that we have here. Let's translate these into kind of corresponding arrows between our buckets, okay? So first of all, let's talk about kind of what the storage variables are, right? So the storage variable for soil moisture here was denoted W1. The storage variable for groundwater storage was denoted W2, okay? And now we have to sort of assign arrows. So let's start with the precipitation arrow. Where should the precipitation arrow be sort of entering our system? If our system is kind of, right, our watershed system is kind of these two buckets collectively. Okay, where should P, where should the precipitation arrow go? Yeah, so we're gonna say it comes in here. What about ET? And this is, okay, so any answers here are probably n not wrong, okay? I, I might sort of override some suggestions just to kind of keep things sort of simplistic, okay? But um, if we drew an arrow called ET from here, what would we be saying about the plants and the evaporation? They're taking directly from the groundwater, right? And is that accurate? Maybe, 
right? I mean, um, probably not in most places. In riparian areas, it's probably true, right? But riparian areas represent a small proportion. So, you know, there's an, again, this involves choices. This is why this is a conceptual model, right? You're making statements about how the, how the watershed actually behaves, and this involves some kind of trade-offs, right? To say like, well, some plants might be drawing from the groundwater directly, but most probably are not, right? So then where should my ET arrow be drawing from? From the soil moisture. Okay, now here's the harder question. Where should my Q be coming out of? Yeah, so one could say, right, that um, my discharge comes directly from groundwater because in principle, going back to the groundwater module, surface water is just kind of a, the, the groundwater expressing itself at the surface, right? So it's most closely connected to the groundwater. However, at the scale of an individual sort of storm, sometimes that's not true, right? We have these other runoff generation mechanisms precipitation excess, infiltration excess, right, that do contribute directly to kind of, to runoff, right? So for now, I wanna connect, I, I wanna say that our discharge will come directly from groundwater, but we might come back and sort of modify that in a second. Okay, so I have all of the arrows here in my watershed that we drew Watershed area is, is not appearing. That's okay, it's a property, we'll come back to it later. Um, what, what is, what's a problem that I have right now with this, this particular diagram? What's weird about, what's weird about this? No transfer between soil and moisture and groundwater. Yeah. My buckets are not connected, and I said that they needed to be connected, okay? So we have to make a decision again about how these buckets are actually connected, okay? So what I want to do is I want to propose that, so this is, um, I'll draw this in a different color. So I, I'm going to kind of draw an arrow that connects these two. And I'm just gonna call this uh, lowercase q12. And lowercase q12 represents the flux of water from the Vados zone, Vados zone to groundwater. Okay, so that's like the recharge flux. Now drawing it this way, I have, I've made a pretty strong statement, right? In particular, this arrow only has one head associated with it, which means what? It's, it's, it can only move in one direction. Right, so I'm only going to allow water to move from the upper bucket to the lower bucket, from the soil moisture to the groundwater. Again, is that physically realistic? In some places it probably is, in other places it definitely is not, right? We can get sort of satur rates, the saturation from below and saturating the whole soil column, okay? But again, for the sake of simplicity, I'm, I'm going to say that water will only move from the upper bucket to the lower bucket. Okay. So now what I want to do is we want to move this to kind of a predictive model, a model that allows us to actually make predictions. Okay. Right now it's just, you know, some arrows and some boxes.
So what is kind of a fundamental, right? So these are fluxes going all the way back to the beginning of the class and kind of one of the core themes running through the entire semester. What is kind of a, this is where the models actually get a little physics based, right? What is some relationship or some rule that we can impose on this system? What did we usually do with these arrows? What do we usually do with these arrows in our, in our watershed? We imposed conservation of mass, exactly. Right, so let's impose mass conservation on both buckets. Okay, so let's write an equation of mass conservation for each bucket. Okay, so what does a statement of mass conservation kind of look like? Like what's on the left-hand side of the equation? Yeah, so a change in storage. So let's do this for bucket one. Okay, so for bucket one, what is the storage variable? Yeah, Skyler says W1, do you all see that? That's our store. Okay, so this becomes D W1 by DT equals, and what are the in and out fluxes? Okay, so what, what should this sign be? So if it's entering the system, right, it would tend to increase the mass, meaning, so any flux that's coming in should have a positive sign, right, because it increases the mass. So P should be what? Positive. Okay. What are the other arrows? ET negative minus ET. And then is there another one? Q12, and what should its sign be? Negative. Negative, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this also in orange, minus Q12. And is that it for bucket one? Yeah? Okay. Let's do bucket two. So bucket two. dw2 dt I skipped ahead is that do you all see that that would be the change in groundwater storage with respect to time is equal to okay now what are the influxes what's coming into the groundwater storage yes yeah, so it says q12 and what should its sign be positive because it's increasing the mass. So Q12, okay. And what are the outfluxes? Discharge, right? My discharge minus Q. Okay. So now at least, right, one thing I would like you all to observe is how these buckets are coupled to one another. Right, so Q12 appears in both of these mass conservation equations. This is how these two buckets are linked to one another, both conceptually and from an equation perspective, right? Right. 
Um, what I really like about this is that underscore is that sort of axiom that sort of, you know, one person's trash is another person's treasure, right? So the stuff that the soil moisture is throwing away is being accumulated by my groundwater storage. Okay. Um, so now this is at least like a, a mass conservation equation, right? So like mass, mass is conserved here, right? So, so any mass that comes into the system is either going to enter storage or it's going to leave as, as a flux, okay? We're still a, a couple of steps away from being able to actually formulate this as kind of an, an equation, right? And part of that is that we need to specify, right? So let's talk about how, let's go through these terms, term by term maybe, and let's talk about whether this is something we, we would measure, something that, that we would calculate, or something else, okay? Like some third category that we don't know, okay? So what about precipitation? Would we measure it? Would we calculate it? Or is it something else? We'd measure it, okay? What about ET? We'd calculate it, right? We might need some other things, some weather data, whatever. But those are observations. So our calculations would be based on observations. What about Q12? Observe, calculate, or something else? Maddie says calculate. Okay. So if we go back to this, right, like is this even something, could we observe this? No. Yeah, this is like a weird, this is a conceptual flux, right? We will have to calculate it, but it's something else, right? It, it falls into that something else bucket. And then finally, what about Q? And this is where, right, this is where things get a little bit dicey. So we can observe discharge, but it is also the thing that we are trying to predict, right? So it also falls into this kind of third bucket of not being something that we observe and input to the model. It's an output from the model, we hope, and something that we want to compare to observations. It's not something we can sort of calculate given kind of external, like meteorological data like ET is. So it also falls into this third bucket, okay? And these third buckets, this third bucket, uh, buckets maybe not, the third basket, I guess, this third category of variables are variables that we need to somehow relate the flux to some other variable, right? To something in the state. Okay, so what are we going to do? What I'm gonna do is we're going to come up with, um, what we will do is we will invoke what's called a linear reservoir relationship for Q12 and Q, okay? And what is a linear reservoir? Well, there's two components to it. What is a reservoir, first of all? Water holding place. A water holding place, right? Do our buckets qualify as water holding places? Yes, so these are, these are our reservoirs, right? And what is, what's linear? What, is, what does linear mean? What was that, Skyler? Uh, yeah, the, so, something is related something to something through a constant, right? Okay, so if we were to say that... Q12 is going to behave according to a linear 
reservoir. What is the reservoir that Q12 would relate to? And what, what would a constant be? Well, the reservoir would be W1. And a constant here, we would just call K12, right? So what does this mean? This says that Q12 is just proportional to how much soil moisture storage there is, right? And conceptually, that sort of makes sense. You could think of this like a sponge, right? The more water that is in a sponge, the more quickly it's going to drain. Right? And as it loses water, that storage is going down. The amount of water in the sponge is going down. So what happens to the rate of water trickling out of the sponge? It correspondingly slows. Right? So that's all a linear reservoir is. Right? So, so this is our soil moisture storage. And this right here is going to be one of our parameters. Okay. All right, let's do the same thing for Q here. So for Q, for my discharge, how would we turn this into a linear reservoir, and what is the what is the reservoir that it relates to? W two, right? And it's just going to be some other parameter. K, we'll call this K two, W two, right? So this is our groundwater. And this is another parameter. <clears throat> okay. So, and let's again sort of back up and think about the physical reality or physical realism of this. This relationship would say that as the groundwater storage increases, what happens? What's that? Discharge will increase. Does that make physical sense? Yeah, probably, right? So the more water in the system, the more it probably will be sort of draining, right? Um, the other way to kind of think about this is that um, you know, the parameter K here represents kind of the fraction of water that is lost from storage at kind of each time step, right? So, um, so you could think of this as being like, okay, if, 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 I'm, if, my, if my fluxes are on a daily time step and I have this water storage, right? What fraction of water in my, what fraction of my storage, stored water is actually gonna leave my watershed every day, right? So you can think of this as kind of a fractional loss coefficient, okay? Okay, so now let's substitute, oops, substitute, into our mass conservation equations, okay? So our first one was dw1 dt, and coming in was precip, leaving was et, and also leaving was Q12, but Q12 is now gonna be represented by this K12 
times W1. So minus K12 W1. Okay. And let's say DW2 DT. So our bucket two said coming in was Q12. Again, Q12 is represented by K12 W1 and leaving was just K2 W2. Okay, so I want to draw a line around these and say that in principle, these come from our meteorological data. Right? We measure precipitation. We talked about how difficult that is, but we measure precipitation. And along with that, we measure something like temperature, wind speed, relative humidity, air pressure, uh, the incoming solar and long wave radiation. And that gives us, that allows us to calculate through something like Penman Monteith, the atmospheric demand for water, right? So we can calculate a PET and we can say something like actual ET is something like some fraction of W1, right? This, you know, W1 over W1 max times PET. We can do something like that, right? So we can relate, right? So all these fluxes should, P and ET should come from meteorological data, okay? So those should be input to our model. Okay, now what do I, what do I have? Anybody who's taken DIPPY-Q? Who's gotten through DIPPY-Q? Okay. What is this? You don't have to know, I'll tell you anyway, but any guesses? This is what's known as a system of ordinary differential equations, okay? Or a so-called initial value problem. Now, what would you do in Diffie-Q? You do something like guess a solution, right? It would look like e to the x times cosine x minus e to the x. There would be some c's in there. You'd differentiate it once and find the homogeneous and inhomogeneous solutions, blah, blah, blah. We're not gonna do that, right? And one of the reasons that we won't do that is because these are not, especially this precipitation is not continuous, right? It's very binary in nature. Either it's raining or it's not, right? Either it's precip or it's not, okay? And, and it's not with predictable periods, it's with somewhat random periods. Right, and so that would mess up any prayer we have at coming up with an analytical solution for what discharge should be. So instead, we're gonna resort to kind of some numerical solutions to this, right? And one way of doing that is to take what's called a finite difference approach, okay? And all finite difference was, is, right, is it's kind of going in the opposite direction of what you do in Calc 1. So what you do in Calc 1, right, how you learn derivatives, how I learned derivatives was actually kind of silly. Um, it was in high school and we printed out like tons of paper computing slopes of particular functions with different values of delta x, right? So you look at, if you remember, it's probably a painful memory, but the limit of some function as delta x goes to zero. Right? So we, we asked, like, what happens when that delta x goes to infinitesimally small? Well, what we're going to say now is, no, it's not going to be infinitesimally small. It's going to be a finite difference. Okay? So we're going to relax these derivatives into being finite differences. Okay? So we will relax the differentials. into finite differences. <clears throat> 
Okay, and what this looks like is that our dw1 dt will become delta w1 delta t, and that will equal p minus et. minus k, one, two, w1, and delta w2, delta t, equals k, one, two, w1, minus k2, w2, and I'll go even one step further And I'll say that um, this is going to be W1 at time t plus one minus W1 at time t over delta t equals P minus ET minus K12 times W1 at time t, and w at t, w2 at time t plus one, minus w2 at time t, over delta t, is equal to k12 of w times w1 at time t minus k, two w2 at time t right i'll say here we were expanding okay and i want to go one step further i want to put everything in the future on one side and everything at the present on the other side of the equal sign, okay? So everything in the future is denoted with a time of t plus one, right? That's the next, that's tomorrow, right? And everything with a t superscript is today, okay? So we will get w1 at t plus one is equal to W1 at T plus P minus ET minus K one two W1 at T times delta T and W2 T plus one is equal to W2 at T plus K12 W1 at T minus K2 W2 time T times delta T. Okay, so these are our model equations. Okay. Let's talk about, okay, so this is, you know, this looks abstract still. But this is our, this is a full model. And in fact, right, one of the crazy things is the models that the National Weather Service uses even to this day are not that much more complex than this. Those of us that are physically based modelers sort of critique that and they're like, yeah, guys, we've known about physics now for quite a while. Let's talk about what we need to actually like create a number, right? What would it, what would it take to create a number and to create a discharge that we could compare to an observation. Okay, so we already, we already talked about P and ET 
So P, we obviously need to measure precipitation. ET, we need met variables. to calculate ET. Okay, what else do we need? What are the other kind of classes of variables that are in here? Current yeah, you need a current st storage for both. And again, in for those of you that have had Diffie-Q, that current, right, so what Skylar just mentioned is W1 at T and W2 at T. That has a very special name. And what is the name for those variables? I talked about how these are initial value problems. An initial value problem requires an initial condition, right? And that merits some discussion. So let's come back to that in a sec, but I want to highlight all of these initial conditions. So W1 at T, W2 at T. This is the initial soil moisture. This is the initial groundwater. Okay. From a practical perspective, oh, I should have highlighted this too. Okay. Um, from a practical perspective, where would we get these at, at sort of our initial time? Any ideas? <laughs> Ideally, we'd measure them, right? Like you could imagine if you had a relatively flat watershed and you had like a groundwater well, you could say, well, I know what my kind of initial groundwater storage is. Soil moisture is a little bit harder. We talked about how we can measure it. Um, but it varies in space. Um, usually what we do when we model is what, what we would do is we would do what's called a model spin-up, right? So we would choose initial values for these variables that are like not, not the actual values, but are also not preposterously out of the realm of possibility. And we would just kind of let the model, we'd let the model kind of run, right? Uh, And eventually, there would be enough forcing, enough precipitation and evapotranspiration that we would get outside of the kind of influence of those initial conditions. Okay. At a subsequent time step, <coughs> at a subsequent time step, right, these initial conditions would just be what we solve for at the next time step, right? So the initial condition for tomorrow's prediction is our prediction from today, right? So our prediction for day after tomorrow depends on what our prediction is for today. Okay. Okay, what else do we need? What are the other variables? 
these guys, right? So these K one two K two um Okay, how do we get these? Yeah, so you can just write, so well, okay, so let's back up for a second. We get W1 and W, we get predictions of the storage. How are those any good to us? Right, like why do we why do we care? Why are we doing that? What is it we're actually trying to predict? We're trying to predict discharge, right? So where is our prediction? Of discharge. So Q at time T plus one, right, would just equal, right, we'll just use this expression that we had. Okay. So now this is our prediction of discharge. I could put a hat over that. So we would compare that prediction of discharge with an observation of discharge. And what we would do is, right, tweak those parameters, right? We would guess an initial set of parameters. I said that, right, if you, if you take a look at this, you can think of this as like the fraction of water lost from each of these reservoirs at each time step. Right, so you would guess some number. It's probably like 1%, right? That would be a good starting point. And you just iterate on that until your predictions of discharge fit your observations best, right? according to some metric that you choose, like an error metric, okay? Okay, so again, the models that actually predict stream flow in the Boise River and elsewhere are not that much more sophisticated than, than this model that we just derived today. Um, but, you know, that's kind of a conceptual model, right? That's how we sort of come up with, that's how we move from all of the modules that we've talked about throughout the class, precipitation, evapotranspiration, soil moisture, groundwater, surface runoff, stream flow. That's how we move from those modules as kind of independent topics to being sort of an integrated set of equations that make predictions about something we care about, in this case, discharge. All right? Okay. Uh, yeah, no lab today. All I could go see now if Hannah. Do you all need help with the previous lab still? I mean, I'm more worried about the homework. I don't know if everybody else. Was it the homework? Uh, I could go see if Hannah's up there. Yeah. Okay. Could we maybe get like an extension on her? Uh, I'll ask. What is it? It's the homework that was due from two weeks ago. Not due two weeks ago, it's due today, but yeah. What was the? Was it due two weeks ago? That was the like. Modules. 
Okay. 